This is something that started several years ago, sort of as a pet project where we were interested in bringing ideas, you know, the whole experiential learning, the roots of it. Uh, we were trying to involve students here at UNH in things that are more real life learning. And one of the things we said is, nah, they were starting to talk about biodiesel, biofuel, natural uh, oils. And we said, well, let's look at some of the stuff we have right <coughs> under our feet. Leaf litter, acorns, stuff like that. And can we somehow bring that into our curriculum, get it to some point where students can get involved in doing things with you know, local campus type activities, where maybe they would eventually be inspired to go out and collect some acorns and see what they make from them. And so the project sort of started off slow, but then I was very lucky to have some excellent collaborators, some wonderful students here at UNH, who helped us get this move along. And if I find the right slide, this is the, uh, should be on the handout, just basically the little abstract. But the idea was, let's see how we can compare the new modern biofuels to the traditional petroleum-based fuels. So those of you who had, I see a bunch of my organic students in here, so you guys will, oh, saw this before. Uh, so a little bit of chem draw for everybody. Um, technically, what is vehicle fuel? And for most of us, our vehicles run on gasoline or diesel. Uh, so if you have gasoline, it's mostly some hydrocarbons. And the organic chemists in here realize we have straight chain hydrocarbons and branch chain hydrocarbons. This little picture here is the chemical symbol representing what's commonly called 224 trimethyl pentane or isooctane, octane rating 100. Good stuff for your car, right? Um, but much of the material in your car also contains straight chain hydrocarbons, octane rating zero, not so good for your car, your engine. So they mix in a lot of other things called octane boosters. Uh, toluene is very common, and that's an aromatic compound, uh, also has good solvent. Uh, we have ethanol, that's very big in the news right now, people blending ethanol with gasoline. It boosts the octane rating. Uh, it also extends the gasoline a little bit using a natural source material. So you're going to see ethanol again today. And over here we have something called MTBE. Ten years ago that was the you know, wonder chemical that was improving octane. Now we found out it gets in the groundwater and the drinking water, so now it's on the baddie list. So they're getting rid of that, replacing it largely with ethanol. If you have a diesel-powered vehicle, you mostly have straight-chain hydrocarbons. And in fact, in diesel, that's what you want. They burn the best. If you get cyclic or aromatic type uh, hydrocarbons, they tend to cause soot and more problems in your engine. And in fact, when we get to the biofuels on the next slide, they're mixing biofuels into diesel largely because as we get into lower grades of diesel, it burns better if we put a little bit of biodiesel uh, into it. So. Biodiesel. If we just, here's another little thing of diesel. Um, our biodiesel is pretty much the same. In fact, if I were to hide part of it, part in color here, uh, you would say, well, it looks exactly the same. In fact, that's why it becomes biodiesel. So what we're doing is taking, instead of a hydrocarbon, something with the same long chain, and that comes from a fatty acid molecule. We'll talk about that a little more shortly. Uh, and it has what chemists call an ester group over here. And the top one is called fatty acid methyl ester. You will see that acronym F-A-M-E. Doesn't refer to a bad movie from like the 80s. Uh, this one down here is fatty acid methyl ester, F-A-E-E. -E. Can't think of anything good for that. OK, now this is going to make all my biologist friends say, oh, bad biology here. OK, I just wanted to chem draw something in, so I just sort of made this up. Um, this is my chemist version of a triglyceride. Uh, what we were doing is, here is your glycerol backbone in red. Over here, we have three different chain lengths of fatty acids. And the C double bond O, O moiety is what we refer to as an acid function. It becomes an ester when it reacts with the glycerol. And in this lower case, we have both cis and trans double bonds. So you may have heard of trans fats. Well, what they're talking about there in trans fats is when there's a trans double bond. So those are the ones bad for your heart, right? Uh, the cis double bonds are the ones that are good for your heart. So if you have salmon oil, uh, you'll find it has a lot more cis double bonds and a lot of them in the chain, uh, whereas things like partially hydrogenated vegetable oil 
have trans double bonds, not so good for your heart. We'll get to that again. So kind of think about that for a little while. Uh, there's just a general representation as chemists would do it with pretty colors. Um, by the way, the greens kind of came out a little yellow, so we're trying to green things up here a little bit. Um, what we're going to do, and you know, our students have done here at UNH, and it's being done all over the world on quite a large scale, is to take methyl alcohol and treat it with typically a base catalyst, sometimes an acid catalyst, but usually a base, something cheap like sodium hydroxide. You can buy it in a hardware store as lye. And people are doing this actually at home. They're, it's somewhat illegal in the sense that you uh, have both tax implications and also you know, hazardous waste implications. So I don't encourage anyone to make their own diesel. You can find recipes on the internet. Uh, but if you're heating up large quantities of lye, there is a serious safety issue there. Okay, so do be careful about not trying this at home. Uh, it's not quite as bad as a meth lab, but you know. Um, it is somewhat hazardous to your health. So uh, if you're in the process of making your own biodiesel, here's what you're gonna do. You would take your triglycerides. This is your oil, your corn oil, whatever you get. Uh, use, cro use cooking oil from you know the Burger King, something like that. Uh, treat it with methanol, heat it up with some sodium hydroxide, and you will get a mixture of basically your now fatty acid methyl esters, where the purple methanol has replaced the red glycerol, and the red glycerol separates out as a separate layer. It settles to the bottom. So, yeah, that's like the intense chemistry for a minute. Now we'll do a little more fun stuff. Um, so biodiesel, we can have FAME and FAEE, and the only really difference is what was the methanol. So if you had methanol, it would be here. If you had ethanol, it has one extra carbon in it. It's over there. So we have the M of methanol. The problem with methanol is that most of our methanol currently comes from natural gas. Some of it comes from coal. And a tiny bit of it comes from biomass. Um, the most traditional method of making methanol, by the way, is called wood alcohol. Anybody want to guess where it came from? Uh, they made it from the charcoal process. So when you make charcoal, a byproduct was methanol. Uh, it's not very efficient. You can make a lot of charcoal and not much methanol. So you can get natural methanol, but I kind of brown the M for methanol here because it's not quite as green as the E in ethanol. We all know ethanol comes from fermenting sugar. Uh, so you know we could take the ethanol component over here. And remember this little part too. We're going to sort of loop back on that a little later in the talk. All right. Now, you're probably wondering how all this comes from acorns. We're going to get there in a minute. We have to first talk about what biodiesel is and you know, what we're going to do with biodiesel. So here's, again, our fatty acid, methyl esters, uh, and ethyl esters are made from triglycerides. Triglycerides contain fatty acids, and they're often unsaturated. So over here, we have just a collection of you know, interesting name things. This one, by the way, oleic acid, oleomargarine. All right, so a little bit of traditional chemistry comes in here. But these are actual carboxylic acids. And I have all cis ones up here by accident. Sorry, I didn't put up any good trans ones. Let's see, where are we going? Okay, so if we think about the fatty acid part of our triglyceride, we need to talk about saturated and unsaturated. Unsaturated is the ones with the double bonds that we just had in the last slide, okay? Saturated are the ones that don't have any double bonds. Now, we all know that saturated fats, not what you wanna be eating, right? Uh, so they're really bad for your heart. However, it turns out they're really good for fuel because those unsaturated fats have a tendency to A, polymerize, so anyone who has any furniture that has you know, some nice linseed oil coating, anybody ever worked with linseed oil? Okay, you coat something with linseed oil, it has to dry for like three months. Okay, what's happening there is it's polymerizing. Now if you use linseed oil in your fuel, it would polymerize just the same way. So if you let your car parked for, you know, have your nice convertible, let it parked all winter, go to use it in the summer and find out, I know there are no diesel convertibles, but hey. Um, your oil turned to gelatinous shellac. 
not good. All right? You would not want your diesel fuel to turn hard. Uh, it wouldn't go through your engine very well at all. So we really don't want too much unsaturated material in our fuel. We want saturated material. Now, the unsaturated material, of course, is better for us. But as I said, it's chemically less stable. And I want you guys to think about this for a minute. That alone, that little piece of chemistry right there, sets up an answer to the question of food versus fuel. If you read things in the common literature, in the newspaper and all, a lot of people will say, one of the problems with biofuels is that if we go and take up a bunch of acreage and plant a bunch of soybeans, OK, we can make a bunch of biofuel. But now, what if somebody in the world doesn't have a lot of money, they were buying cheap soybeans, now all of a sudden soybeans are expensive because they're replacing you know, four and a half dollar a gallon diesel fuel. Well, soybeans turn out to be very unsaturated. You're going to see that in a minute. So if we pick things that were saturated, nobody wanted them for fuel and, or food in the first place, then maybe they're a better source of uh, fuel. So that leads to my little question here. What are the natural sources uh, of more saturated triglycerides? So it's sort of counter to everything you're going to see in the medical, you know, the medical profession is looking for things that have nice, you know, saturated or unsaturated fats that are good for your health. Uh, here we are, we're the chemists, we have to go against the grain no matter what, right? So uh, we're going to give you some materials that uh, have bad for your health char characteristics. Uh, this little slide here, and it has something called the iodine value. The biologists would recognize this. Uh, the chemist might recognize this. This is a very traditional test. It's a measure of unsaturation of an oil. So if you have uh, you know, oil from whatever source, and I excerpted these from a table that had absolutely you know, many, many different sources of oil, and I picked the ones that had relatively low iodine values, a couple exceptions at the end here, uh, because I wanted to show you some oils that are out there and probably not good for people to eat, but might be good for fuel. And I also have another column here, which gives you the predominant chain length. And that was, remember the slide I told you, I just sort of randomly drew chain lengths? Uh, for the most part, most of your triglycerides have chain lengths that are largely in the about 12 to 22 range. But the biggest part of the bell curve is in the 14 to 16 to 18. And they're all even numbers. All of your bio uh, diesel, bio fatty acids uh, have even numbered carbons in the chain. So you get like 6, 8, 10, right? OK, so lard oil. So you're making your bacon. You have that wonderful greasy stuff that you soak up in napkins and throw away or whatever because it's nasty when you go clean up pans. Uh, lard oil is relatively saturated. We all knew that. They tell us, you know, don't eat the bacon fat. It's not good for you. It's fairly saturated. Uh, beef fat's even worse. So you know, when you cook down a pot roast and the stuff floats to the top and you skim it off. Yeah, you can put it in a fridge and it's going to turn hard and look like butter, but you probably don't want to eat that. Use it for biofuel. Um, sheep, anybody who likes lamb, mutton tallow, that's pretty low on the scale, right? So mutton tallow is even more saturated, bad for your health. I threw this one in because we're in New England, and I found the number, and I thought, hey, New England, sperm whales, we got to do it, right? Um, this was the capital of the whaling industry for many years. so. If you happen to see a whale washed up on the beach and you know he's dead and you can't rescue him, uh, hey, biofuel. Um, <laughs> uh, castor oil, castor oil, castor beans. That is one of the things they're considering for biofuel. It is somewhat more unsaturated, so it's not really the best biofuel. We do, as chemists, have a way of fixing that, though. And for the most part, castor oil is not used substantially as a food substance, is it? It's not considered good. Uh, coconut oil. Now, here's all the people who are label readers. If you read your stuff and you know your peanut butter or whatever has included in it a little bit of coconut oil, you can write a nasty letter to that company. Oops, here it is, coconut oil. Because <laughs> coconut oil has one of the lowest iodine values. It is very saturated oil. Uh, interestingly, by the way, it's also relatively short chains. Now, corn oil, that's what we love in the United States. We have our great quantities of corn oil. 
uh, good for making French fries and all. It's really not that bad. It is somewhat unsaturated. And if you heat it too long, though, you do get breakdown and more trans fats, but that's another problem. Uh, soybean oil, which is what we are currently using, and you'll see in a future slide here, about 73% of our soybean, uh, of 73% of our biodiesel is currently made from soybeans, grown intentionally for that purpose. So soybean oil, which is very unsaturated, um, it's mostly a C18, that's 18 carbon length chain, and it has two uh, double bonds somewhere in that chain. Uh, is often used for diesel just because you can grow it fairly easily. Okay, uh, saturated oils are most common in waste foods, you know, grease, the, the stuff you got out of your baking pan, right? Your fryer, whatever. Um, and also degraded cooking oils, such as if you go down to the Burger King on the corner and get the used French fry oil. Uh, certain competing schools upstate are using their campus fryer oil to run their campus shuttle. All right, we can do better than that. We're high class here. We use acorns. Um, anyway, uh, but if you want to grow oil seeds, there are a lot of things you can grow. And there are two issues with this. One is agriculturally, are we going to take land away from food crops to grow oil seeds? Uh, and the other thing is, you know, what seeds will we grow? Part of that depends on where you live in the world. You know, we're kind of far north, so we're not going to grow, grow too many coconuts, are we? Not Connecticut coconuts. <laughs> All right, that would be some serious global warming. Um, soy can grow here fairly well. Corn grows OK. Uh, but you also have to consider how much of this material you would get per acre. And that's a problem. What, there's only like Hawaii and uh, Rhode Island or neighbor that are smaller, right? In fact, uh, if you look at the statistics of New England, do you guys realize that New England is smaller than Oklahoma? That's all of New England, okay? Connecticut, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island. I guess that, does it include Maine? I guess it should. Uh, put them all together and you have something slightly, it would bend it around and fit it inside Oklahoma. So if you're trying to grow things, Oklahoma does a good job of growing things. Uh, we have pretty steep competition. Uh, we don't have a lot of surplus land available for farming. In fact, we're losing a lot of farmland up here to development. So we're not likely to go out and get new farms. The areas we see as wooded space are typically parks or you know state land or so on. We're not likely to go and clear that area to make new farmland. And how efficient would it be? Uh, even if we planted something like soybeans, we're going to get maybe 50 gallons of diesel per acre. We don't have a lot of acres here. Um, what about marginal lands? Now this is something, this is a little more political. It's something being considered right now. Marginal lands, we do have a lot of marginal lands in Connecticut and New England, relative. Uh, so of the land we have, we have a lot of land which is polluted. We all know all the wonderful industrial sites from a few generations ago that you probably don't want to be growing food on, right? How many people would want to go to certain polluted areas of even New Haven and grow something that you're going to eat? You know, oh, what's a little arsenic, right? Um, we don't want to do that. Uh, brownfields, that's areas where they've torn down previous facilities, uh, you know, no longer used areas. And interestingly, highway periphery. And this may turn out to be one of the most important things. Right now, Connecticut pays a lot of money for either our own workers or outsourced contractors to go and mow the grass along our highways. Now, the grass along our highways could not be used, the areas along our highways could not be used for food production, even if we wanted to, because your cars make a lot of pollution. Not just air pollution, but you also get lead, platinum, palladium coming out of the catalyst, and so on, which get into the soil and you probably wouldn't want that stuff getting into our food system. So as a result, there's a lot of highway periphery where you could grow something like canola, something that's not really used for foods, and it turns out it would pr produce a lot of oil. And why pay someone to mow the grass? Someone will pay us to grow canola. So there is potential there. If we want to start adding up all little bits and pieces, we're going to start taking a notch out of the petroleum problem. Um, 
And here's a part for our campus. What if we gleaned wasted, unrecognized crops? And here come the acorns, right? So, you know, we said canola and mustard seed along the highway, airport, so on. Uh, tree seeds. Now, right here on campus, we managed to collect a bunch of tree seeds. And we have some acorns. And I like to thank my students for these samples. So I'll pass these around in order. Uh, there are, we took the acorn apart, in case anyone's never stopped and stepped on an acorn and looked at it. Uh, there are shells, and there is what we call the nut meat. Uh, that's the part inside the acorn. And then we ran it through a blender. You'll see some interesting slides here. Hello, did it go? Three seeds. Go ahead, one. Where's my blender? All right, we'll get these in a second. I got them out of order. Uh, and then, you know, we took this that we, this is called flour, seed flour. So we ground it up, made flour. Then we extracted the oil out of it, and this is the residue. It's much more powdery. If you notice, it's sort of dusty. And if you guys want, I'll leave these up front. We don't have to pass these all around because these are a little bit bigger. But we also collected cherries. I collected these over uh, in front of Harry Gary Hall. If you've ever noticed, there are a bunch of cherry trees there. By the way, the cherries are pie cherries. They're a little bit tart. <laughs> Don't know how we know that. Um, if you break them open, uh, you get the shells. And there's quite a lot of shells on cherries. Where's the math majors? All right, volume of a sphere. So if the shell is approximately the same thickness, the bigger the sphere gets, the more insides you get, right? So we didn't get so much insides out of the cherries. But I'll tell you the great thing about the inside of a cherry seed, it's like 60% oil, depending on the seed. So you can get a lot of oil out of a cherry seed. Uh, and then after we ran them the same way those were. So here's our crushed <coughs> cherry meal. And then we have some residue. And finally, we get oil. And there are two different oils here, and I'll invite you guys to look at these. The one over here, you can actually see it's getting sort of hardened and thick and looks sort of opaque -y. This one's a prettier color. These are made from the exact same seeds. The difference is this one was treated in a normal apparatus in the air. This one was done in an inert atmosphere, shielded from the air. So when I was telling you about the fuel in your gas tank gelatinizing and hardening, just like linseed oil, uh, even if it was cherry seed oil, we do have to be careful of that. Don't worry, we have a chemistry solution to that in a moment. Uh, let me finish showing the samples here. Uh, if you collected a kilogram of in this case, acorns, you would make about this much oil. All right, so kilograms about two pounds. So two pounds of acorns would make about this much. And what you're going to find out shortly is how much uh, acorns is a kilogram. Well, if you get a drywall bucket, two drywall buckets make a bushel, and a bushel is about 50, 50 some pounds. So a drywall bucket's about 25 pounds. So 25 pounds and two pounds made this. So a drywall bucket would make about 10 times this or so. OK? So if you're collecting acorns, it's not too bad. And we're getting close to the raking season, although we notice this year's crop is very, very poor. We got frosted this spring. Uh, and this came from a kilogram of cherries. So it's a little bit darker uh, because of our processing and so on. It's a little bit more unsaturated. Oh. And then finally, we converted these to the fatty acid methyl ester. So this is our biodiesel, OK? And over here, we have biodiesel. This one is actually made from corn, uh, but it was distilled. And then this one's what we call hydrogenated. This is what we'll get to last. And you may notice this one's a little crystally. That's a whole other issue. Oh, thank you. It's my laser. OK, this slide. Uh, tree seeds. I said one of the things about these is they're already collected. One of the questions about many biofuels, and a lot of economists are looking at biofuels because they're saying, well, if we want to go out and collect and grow corn or soybeans or something, how much energy are we inputting into the system? People will say, oh, okay, well, you can get 56 gallons of biodiesel per acre from soybeans. 
but how much petroleum diesel was used by a farmer to plow, seed, harvest, everything else, weed, spray bug spray, onto that acre. Turns out he uses a lot of petroleum diesel to plant the soybeans and grow them in the first place. So it's not necessarily a winning predicament. Here in New England, what do we all do? We either do it ourselves, or we get some landscaper to come and collect all of our leaves and acorns off of our yard so we don't have a horrible mess, right? Don't want to kill the grass, we rake them up. Throw them in a truck, where do they go? Right here in West Haven, there's a great big compost site. So they're already collected up, all we have to do is separate them out. Uh, this could be of added value to a landscaper because right now a landscaper has to either pay someone to get rid of that stuff or be a member of an organization where he can dump it and it gets composted. What if he can get a little bit of value back for that? Separate out the acorns, you get a ton of acorns. Hey, now you get five bucks. Um, stabilized rodent populations. I put it in here to be a little bit polite. Squirrels are very industrious. Squirrels will find the acorns that we missed. Uh, the problem is in some years when there's a huge boom crop of acorns, you may notice the squirrel population explodes followed by a die off the next year or two. Uh, so, you know, maybe we could, we kind of got rid of all the predators in this state except for the local coyote, which was seen across the street this summer. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Rodents may not completely love us, but I don't think we'll kill them. Uh, so that's why I use the word stabilize. Uh, encourage continuation and care for our trees. That's something, you know, I wore the tree shirt. Uh, New England, what do we do? We have all these tourists coming to see our trees, right? We don't want to cut them all down and look like Iowa, do we? Iowa has their own beauty. So we want to save our trees. Um, one of the reasons I like seed trees, uh, if you have, like, my wife here knows we have big trees on our yard. Uh, <laughs> saves a lot on air conditioning, okay? Nothing like shade to cut down on air conditioning costs. Uh, it also cuts back on the wind, somewhat cuts back on the noise. Trees are a great buffer for noise pollution. Uh, they do absorb some air pollution just by surface area and so on, as well as CO2 if you're considering that as carbon dioxide pollution. Uh, and interestingly, they uptake groundwater nutrients. In doing my research for this material, I found that I'm not the only person to make the qualitative observation that trees along athletic fields have bigger acorns. It turns out that's because we put a lot of fertilizer on athletic fields. Grass roots only go down maybe a foot or so. Any nutrients, nitrates, urea, the stuff we put on athletic fields that get past those grass roots go down into our water table. All right, in the Midwest, with a lot of farms, that's a big problem because if the corn roots don't catch it, it gets down in the ground, groundwater. If your field is surrounded by big trees, oak trees, the roots can go many feet into the soil and they will scavenge nutrients which the grass missed. Now, it, uh, we collected a bunch of our acorns for this experiment out at Kerrigan Middle, Middle School. Um, the best acorns are right around the athletic field where you get humongous acorns. So it's very clear that the nutrients from the athletic fields were getting into the soil and oak trees didn't seem to mind. Um, of course, if you're looking at the groundwater, that's a good thing to strip that stuff out of the groundwater because people don't like to drink nitrates. Um, provide habitat. Anyone who likes, you know, all the little critters that live in the trees, if you didn't have trees, you wouldn't have any squirrels, right? Squirrels in cornfields, yeah, they're not real uh, happy about that. Provide biomass, AKA wood, right? Uh, so we can get lumber, firewood, all the good things from trees so we can create a nice little fireplace thing you know, when we get home in the evening or something. And we preserve our New England landscape. All right, a little bit of chemistry here. So we take our seeds, and this is the stuff I just passed around, so hopefully everybody got a chance to look at some of those. We took our seeds, here's some cherry seeds, here's some acorns. So we had acorn, I forget which way these go. I think these were the acorn shells, the acorn meats, or vice versa. Uh, not real clear on this photo. And I think the other one was the acorns that were filtered out. Uh, the student who did this work was Rob Omita, and uh, he picked out all the nasty looking uh, bug infested 
rotted nuts. Let's see how much it was. And out of our, out of our drywall bucket, uh, we were doing pretty good. We got mostly good stuff. Uh, over here are the cherry seeds. They're too little. We didn't sort them. Uh, we just ground them up in a blender. So if we take our seeds, we crack them apart, we can get shells. Shells, well, unless you throw them in a the fireplace, not much going on there. But you take the nut meat, you crush it, put it in a blender, and we get what's called the seed flour. The seed flour can be pressed. If you press it, you get virgin oil. You can get all virgin olive oil. We all go out and buy that for cooking. Uh, that gets quite a bit of oil out of it just by pressing. However, depending on how much was in the seed, however, it's not all of the oil. So you would have what's called an oil cake. The oil cake can further be extracted. That's the you know low-grade oil that you get that's just generic olive oil. Um, that's been extracted from the oil cake. In our case, we directly went from the seed flour. We extracted these and got, instead of more oil, we just got lots of oil, right? It's out of the jar. So we got lots of oil. Now, if you wanted, you could take the residual seed cake. You can dissolve out the sugars and starches. The residue would be good for animal feed because it's high in protein and we get more biomass. Um, but if we took the sugars and starches, we could create alcohol by fermentation. And remember when I said FAEE, fatty acid ethyl ester, the green biodiesel? Well, you could get that uh, directly from here's half of it, the oil's the other half of it, put them back together, and you have some nice green biodiesel. Now, here's the fun part. We're just going to go through a little tour. So we ground up the cherries. Uh, this is called a Soxlet thimble. That's what fits in the next apparatus you're going to see. And here we got a bunch of the, in this case, cherry flour in it. And this is the Soxlet apparatus. There's the thimble. Uh, there's just a little bit of insulation on these to try and save a little heat. Uh, the flask down here boils a solvent like hexane. The vapors come up, condense in a condenser, drip through this, and extract out the oil. This is the standard biological <laughs> method for determining the oil content of a seed. So while this would not be industrially productive to make large quantities of oil, it is useful uh, to find out how much oil we can get from our seeds. The next thing we did is we filtered it because inevitably a little bit of the seed flour gets out of the thimble. Uh, <laughs> and so we filtered it. And then we put on an uh, apparatus called a rotary evaporator. And under vacuum, it reduces the volume of solvent, leaving us with some beautiful I think this is acorn oil, I'm not sure. I cut off the caption. Um, and then we're ready for a next process called transesterification. So if it's placed in another reaction vessel over here, you may recognize this from Organic Lab. It's called a reflux system. This has the oil, methanol, and catalyst. You get our biodiesel, which then must be separated. So the glycerin layer with the water comes off the bottom, and the biodiesel is up top. It floats take this material from the funnel. This has a little drain cock in it, so we separate out the bottom layer. And if we want to make really top shelf biodiesel, because hey, we're UNH, we don't you know, deal with that scummy stuff, we're going to go and we're going to vacuum distill it. Now vacuum distilling will give you top quality stuff, but it is a little bit energy intensive. So what did we get? Well, vegetable oils from pressing or extracting. And one thing I'm going to bring up shortly uh, that we're interested in eventually getting to here at UNH. Carbon, di carbon dioxide methods, uh, liquid, supercritical liquid carbon dioxide. If you have one of the you know, new environmentally friendly dry cleaners, they no longer use the sticky solvent where you walk into dry cleaners and you know, get that very interesting aroma of chemicals. Uh, if you go into one that doesn't smell like they do anything at that shop, they probably actually have the carbon dioxide method, which is much more environmentally friendly. Most of the carbon dioxide actually comes as a byproduct of fermentation, just like the stuff you get in your Pepsi machine in the dining hall. Um, so they collect the carbon dioxide from fermentation, compress it, it becomes a liquid, and you can use it to extract oils out of seeds or keep oils out of clothes. Oh yeah, and by the way, keep oil is on the list. I didn't put it up there, but that was called depot fat. Um, it's, we're, we're fairly saturated. Don't eat people. Um, <laughs> Animal oils from cooking down and skimming processes. This is your standard cooking. So anyone who makes soup, you get the stuff off the top. We all skim the stuff off the top of the soup, right? At least since the you know, 1700s, nobody likes that stuff. So we skim it off, throw it into a used milk carton, and throw it away, right? Well, hey, collect it, save it, biofuel. Uh, waste grease from fryers and stuff. If you're big enough to be the Hardee's, then you can uh, get your biofuel directly from your cooker. 
and triglyceride feedstock must be processed. When we do, we get biodiesel. And this is one of our students' pieces of data. What we have here are a couple of peaks on a gas chromatogram. These are showing uh, the data from cherry fatty acid methyl ester. And if you see, you have C16 and C18. C18 has a couple peaks. That's because we have some unsaturated material as well as saturated material. And if you saw the cherry oil, there's quite a bit of saturated. You notice the saturated and unsaturated peaks are similar in height. There's also, I believe that's a doubly unsaturated peak. They'll say I was wrong. That's what I get for not knowing the data. Uh, the raw transesterified, transesterified product, or FAME, uh, that's what you get if you have a backyard biodiesel operation. Okay? A lot of people will do this. They get their biodiesel, make the transesterified material, and you can run it, but it's going to eventually foul your engine because it has a lot of impurities. Residual alcohol from methanol or ethanol, trace water, glycerol, even if you separate the lower layer, there's still residual glycerol in most of it, unless you really wash it out good. Um, partially reacted triglycerides, which are now mono or diglycerides. Uh, residual catalyst, that's sodium hydroxide. Do you really want to be throwing soap and lye into your engine? Think about that. Um, terpenes and aromatic substances, these won't really affect your engine at all, uh, but they will affect the color and smell of your biodiesel. And unsaturated and saturated ester mixture. That's nice in a sense that it keeps it from crystallizing. And I love this here. I just took this picture today. Uh, forgot to have this one. I pulled these out of the freezer, and you'll notice that they were solid. So if you come up here and look at them now, they're nice and liquid. The problem with biodiesel is it doesn't like cold weather. Okay? Saturated fatty acids tend to solidify. So keep thinking about the margarine thing. Uh, we can remove the, you know, a lot of the impurities by washing, and that's what your backyard operations do. But to get truly high-quality stuff, you have to vacuum distill it. I know there is one manufacturing facility in Australia that's currently making their biodiesel that way. So they're selling nice, clear, white, top-shelf biodiesel. Further hydro-treating it will allow us to finish the product where it becomes uh, you know, less saturated, if not fully saturated. Um, and that would make our product a little bit nicer, more stable. It will not polymerize. And there are less species of mold and stuff that seem to like it. So you don't quite have to refrigerate it and have it turn hard. OK, here's the best part. Here's our bucket. By the way, that little line on this drywall bucket is 1 half bushel. And if you can read the scale, it is 19.8 pounds at that point. OK? so. These are some fairly dried out acorns and not bad. So uh, acorns or cherry pits, the ones we got here on campus, we were able to obtain about 18 to 22% oil by weight. That's from the raw material. So when you carry a bag of acorns, and you know we carried a few bags of acorns around this campus, uh, that's fairly interesting how much you can get. Um, if you estimate that an average oak tree, and I had a lot of fun trying to find data on this, so I just used my own, uh, what I raked out of the yard. Uh, the numbers are all over the map for productivity of acorns. I mean, it's not just regional, it's per tree, species, day, month, year, you know. Uh, so you can get all kind of different values for it. But I estimated you get about two to 10 drywall buckets of acorns per mature tree. Okay, that's not bad. And so if you want to do the whole factor label method of science here, you can go through my calculations and see if I messed up. But uh, a drywall bucket's about a half bushel. A bushel of acorns about 53 pounds. About 80% of its mass is what I call viable. In other words, worms didn't eat all oil already. Uh, so how many acorns can we get? Uh, average northern red oak tree, and I did find a reference for this about how big an average northern red oak tree would be. Uh, can populate our landscape, if you figure a nice suburban landscape, about 27 trees per acre. Um, and that means there's about one to eight suburban urban yards per acre. So, you know, how much could you contribute? Um, at only 20, 20 trees per acre, got to put our house somewhere, you know. Even though the trees can go over our house. That's a nice thing. Beats, we beat soybeans there. Soybeans cannot grow up over your house. 
okay? If they do, we have to run. Um, genetically modified soybeans, right? Um, so about 20 trees per acre. You can get 125 to 25. I did you know, the reverse way on a low mast year. Last, mast means acorn crop uh, of gallons of diesel per acre. So you say, ooh, on a good year, I can get 125 gallons of diesel. Well, that compares quite well. Soy, which is fairly reproducible out in a farm field in Iowa, is going to give you about 56 gallons per acre. And the, in the best years, uh, that would be, you know, we're doing better than that. And it's almost as good as castor oil, which can give us 156 gallons per acre. So we all should be thinking about why are the farmers growing soybeans instead of castor beans. I don't know that for real, uh, but they could get a lot more profit out of castor oil. OK, if you know anything about agriculture, oak trees, the ultimate no-till farming, right? No-till farming is where they don't dig up the soil every year and plant new uh, corn or whatever. They just sort of spray pesticide and herbicide and stick the seeds back in the dirt and let them grow. Uh, so oak trees, fortunately, they have a lifetime of a couple hundred years. That's sort of not my problem, right? Uh, somebody planted a tree, and it's going to outlive me. Uh, last year, soy produced about 73% of our biodiesel, or about 75,000, 75 million gallons in the United States. 75 million gallons seems like an awful lot of fuel. Uh, unfortunately, we used 63 billion gallons of over-the-road diesel. All right, so that's just in the U.S. We're not counting our Canadian friends or anything. So to replace all of our diesel with corn, acorn biodiesel, uh, we would need 1.6 billion acres. I think this is going to prove that there's no single answer to our biofuel or petroleum fuel quandary. Okay? We can't just say one thing is going to drop in and replace all of our uh, stuff. So if we do, were doing this on a little suburban landscaper kind of model, a little bit of math for you know, the United States means we th need a thousand times more residents in homes than we currently have. That doesn't work. Uh, I don't think there's that much population on the whole planet, is there? Getting close. 300 million to, that'd be 300 billion. No, we're nowhere near that. Uh, there is no single replacement, but what is fun about this is we can create value. We can create jobs, you know, maybe help our landscapers get a little extra money out of their occupation. Uh, maybe displace a little bit of our fossil fuel fossil fuel usage and uh, you know get a little bit of biofuel tonnage by the way last year the world used 11 billion metric tons of equivalent of oil that includes coal so they call coal oil equivalent so if you figure 6 billion people use 11 billion metric tons every person on the earth is responsible for 2 metric tons of oil being used so basically, if your car was oil and you tried to lift it. Um, and so here, I, I like to use this, the Puritan approach. We're in New England, right? We have the Puritan culture up here. Uh, why waste anything? Why throw the acorns in a compost pile? Maybe somebody can make them into biodiesel. Uh, biofuels present several opportunities for consumers. I'll just go through this slide quickly because we're getting near the end. But basically, it gives our engineers the opportunity to design better engines and so on because we're talking about single substance fuels. Right now, our petroleum is a mixture of hydrocarbons, aromatic, unsaturated, saturated, etc. But if you're talking about biofuels, you have the opportunity to create a very, very pure fuel, very low in sulfur, low emissions, and it could possibly uh, give new opportunities for engineering as well as chemistry. Uh, continuing work here at UNH, we are working with the marine biology program uh, to evaluate algaes and their potential for oil. We have a lot of algae right off the coast here. As, just as I said, the oak trees can pull pollution out of our groundwater. Algae pulls pollution out of our seawater. And in doing so, it grows itself. And so we may be able to get something out of that. Uh, extraction methods, we would like to move into supercritical carbon dioxide. That's a lot more environmentally friendly. Uh, it's also it doesn't catch fire, which we've been very fortunate, no fires. Um, investigate 
FAEE, including acid catalyzed, I could be a synthetic chemist, okay? That's what I am. So, uh, and biodiesel product, we are looking at some HPLC protocols as well to sort of do some qual quality assurance on our biodiesel products. Finally, I would like to thank everybody who uh, helped mm -hmm. us out with this. Um, you know, we get to do some fun here. I hope everybody who's been involved in this project, uh, we have a couple people here, Joey and Heather. Anybody else here that I see? Uh, you guys worked on this. Uh, so I thank my research group that worked on the biofuels. There are other people doing research here. This is just the biofuel people, uh, including with me. Uh, and it started a few years ago. Kyle Witten has graduated. He did some excellent work a few years ago. Uh, John has just uh, joined our group recently. Heather and Jillian worked this summer. They did some very good work. Rob worked on it last summer. He did some good work. In fact, uh, a lot of the pictures were his, I believe, uh, as well as these other guys. So I'd like to thank all of them for the pictures. Uh, one or two of them were mine, probably the bad ones. Uh, <coughs> I did receive a summer faculty fellowship from the Statical Leave Committee the other year. And so that led to some of this work and a lot of the supplies that these guys got to use and so on. Uh, and of course, the laboratories and the University of New uh, New Haven for letting us use our laboratories last summer and previous summers and every time we could squeeze out a hood to make a mess and make acorns into biodiesel. And thank you guys all for attending. I appreciate it. Hope you learned something.